This morning, let's take our Bibles and turn to the New Testament book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible and the last written word from God. Revelation chapter 8 and 9, under the title, Trumpets of Judgment. Trumpets of Judgment. Chapter 8 is going to talk about opening the seventh seal, which is going to contain the seven trumpets. And we're going to see the end of the first half of the tribulation time. Now let's ask the Lord to help us and to give us his wisdom, shall we? Father, we're grateful for this chance to study your word. We ask you to help us to really understand it and be changed by it. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. amen. By way of background, if you're new to the study of Revelation, Revelation is in three parts. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 19 gives the most sensible division of Revelation. John is told by the Lord Jesus, write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. The things which you have seen, that's chapter 1. Jesus Christ in his glorified state as King of kings, Lord of lords, as the one who will judge the Christ-rejecting world. Chapters 2 and 3 give us the things which are, and that's the church age, the time in which you and I live. The evaluation by the Lord Jesus of the seven churches in what is today western part of Turkey, uh, and John had pastored one of those churches, the church at Ephesus, so had Paul, so had Timothy, and uh, they are given an evaluation church by church. You and I ought to be concentrating on chapters 2 and 3 and seeing where we fit in the church today, and we ought to be governing our prayers for ourselves and our others based on chapters 2 and 3 because the Lord has some very strong words to say about his church. Chapter 4 is the rapture of the church. Caught up in verse 1. After these things, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. The first voice I heard was like a trumpet saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Many see that as a parallel to the rapture of the church caught up in heaven, and we see the 24 elders around the throne representing perhaps the church of Jesus Christ. Chapters 4 and 5 do talk about heaven, talk about where we're going to be during the tribulation as the Lord begins to judge the world and take back the deed to this world. We saw in chapter 5 that Jesus took the scroll with seven seals the scroll seems to be the title deed of the earth. God had given dominion of the earth to Adam and Eve in chapters 1 and 2 of Genesis. We know they sinned in chapter 3 and gave that right to the world to the devil. Jesus and Paul said that the devil is the god of this age and the prince of this world. So right now, the title deed is under the control of Satan. And we see his work all around, don't we? Well, Jesus takes these seals, and he is going to start breaking those seals. And uh, the seals would be seals on a long scroll, and they would be breaking one, and then you'd unfold some of the scroll. You'd break the second seal on down until the final seventh seal. This is the title deed, the right to claim this world for Jesus Christ and for us again. The first Adam lost this world. The second Adam, Jesus Christ, has redeemed this world for us. And so these are the events to punish the world for its refusal to come to Jesus Christ. For that and so many other reasons, the church will not be in this tribulation time. And the Apostle Paul makes that very clear to the Roman church. He talks about Jesus in Romans chapter 8, and he tells us there that we are going to be delivered from the wrath to come. And so we need to be clear in our minds that the wrath of Jesus Christ is not for his church, but for those who reject him. 
Uh, since we are filming and we are recording for audio, please turn off your phones if you would, please. Um, now, let's begin today with the study of the breaking of the seals. And uh, as each seal is broken, there are going to be catastrophic events here on earth. This document, this title deed, which has seven seals, and by the time we get to the seventh seal, we're going to see that the seventh seal, as it opens, reveals seven more judgments known as the seven trumpets. And we uh, see that today. The chapter six begins the first seal, the revealing of the Antichrist, the second seal, conflict or war, the third seal, there's famine or starvation. The fourth seal, there's widespread death. Fifth seal, the death of the martyrs during the tribulation time. The sixth seal, cosmic disturbances in the heavens and the earth. Chapter 7 gives us a pause while God seals 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each tribe, and he's going to commission them to go out to the then known world to preach the gospel, we believe. They have the name of the Father on their foreheads. And we see in the latter part of chapter 7, the multitude who have been slain for the testimony of Jesus Christ. They are with the Lord in heaven, they have died, but he is coming to uh, redeem them and to vilify the enemy and to vindicate his people. Now, chapter 8, we're talking about today the seventh seal. And as the seventh seal is broken, we're going to be seeing more devastation. There is a progression. The damage done by the first six seals being opened is terrible. The damage done by the uh, seventh seal and opening up six more trumpets is even worse. The opening up of the or sounding of the last trumpet is going to open up seven bowls of judgment, which are far worse than that. Putting this on the timeline, first of all, where we are today, 2012, almost 2013. The next event for us is going to be chapter 4. In Revelation, we're caught up to heaven. Then we see the earth plunged into seven years of tribulation. That began in chapter 6 with the first seals. We are now coming today to the end of that first three and a half years of that seven-year period. After today, we're ready for the middle of the tribulation when it gets very rough. And then, and only then, are we dealing with the last three and a half years which are known as the Great Tribulation, and in some places referred to as the Tribulation. In other words, what we've seen and we're going to see today is, comparatively speaking, nothing compared to what's going to happen in the future. To quote the old saying, you ain't seen nothing yet. All right, let's begin now with chapter 8 as we talk about preparation in heaven. There is still one more seal on that title deed to be broken, the seventh seal. Jesus is going to open it now in verse 1. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. So there's going to be an awesome silence like the calm before the storm. Can you imagine silence? Did you ever remember silence? We don't have silence anymore. Uh, unless you get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and go outside and leave your television off and your uh, uh, iPad and everything else off, it's hard to find silence anymore. It's awesome. And uh, it can be peaceful and it can be also very eerie. This will be silence, the calm before the storm for a half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Now, a trumpet in Israel was used to announce a number of things. Assembly, war, a feast, and here it's going to be announcing judgment. And then another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. 
Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. So this we have as the preparation in heaven, the calm before the storm. After the silence, the most important thing to God before he moves, the most important thing to God before he unleashes his judgments is the prayers of the saints. Revelation tells us how important our prayers are, and we see it in the Old Testament as well. David says in one of his Psalms, may my prayers be like the evening uh, incense before you. There was an incense offering in the tabernacle, later on the temple. And we see a picture here of it going on in heaven. Remember, the tabernacle was really a little model on earth of what was happening in heaven. And what you saw in the tabernacle was a picture of heaven. If you want to see heaven, the clearest places in scripture, I think, are Revelation chapters 4 and 5, which I just mentioned, and then go back and look at the little tabernacle in the book of Exodus. That will show you what heaven is about. And we see the throne, we see the altar, we see the uh, uh, altar of sacrifice. Here we see the altar of incense. And uh, this angel now is going to uh, be carrying on the same thing those priests did so long ago. This angel has a golden censer, just like the high priest would have in the Old Testament times. A censer was a, basically a copper uh, pan. Later on, it was gold in the temple. And uh, it would be having some cords on it, probably metal cords. And uh, coals were taken from the first altar outside the tabernacle, the altar where they would sacrifice the animals, known as the burnt offering uh, altar. And they would take these hot coals, put them on this censer, this pan, and carry it before the altar of incense in the tabernacle, just before the curtain behind which was the throne of God, the Ark of the Covenant. They would then have another container with incense in it, and the prescription of that incense, the formula, was exact. And God said, don't try to duplicate it, because if you do, you will die. So I've never tried to duplicate the formula, and I advise you not to do it as well. He would take, with one hand, some incense, put it... In the, on top of the hot coals in the censer on the other hand and the smoke would go up at the hour of prayer as the people prayed to God. That becomes a visual and aromatic picture really of our prayers before God. How important are our prayers before God? He instituted it right in the tabernacle worship. We see it here and it is a sweet smelling savor unto God. So here this angel before God does anything is hearing and honoring the prayers of his people. How important are your prayers and mine before God? He was given much incense, much because there were many prayers. The prayers being offered at this time are the saints who are still alive during the tribulation time. Believe it or not, there will still be people who will survive all of this holocaust. And they are praying to God for justice and praying to God for salvation. And God is hearing their prayers. This is one of the clearest pictures we have in scripture that God does hear our prayers. And much incense is given because many prayers are going to be offered. And he offers the prayers of all the saints, every single one of those who belong to Christ, upon the golden altar, which is before the throne. So God is hearing the prayers of those saints who are still alive here on earth. Now the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar. So he apparently went out and he got more, more coals and he threw it to the earth. And the result here on earth is noises, thunderings, lightnings, earthquake. Very much like it was when Moses was getting the law on Mount Sinai. 
There the law was given with these awesome signs. Here the law has been broken by man and the awesome signs attended as well. And now we're just about to begin the second third of the punishments. We got through the first six. We opened the seventh one. And now we begin with the first trumpet. The first angel sounded sounded his trumpet, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. We're not just talking about a localized area. We're talking about the whole world. Trumpet number one is going to be so severe that it's going to have hail, it's going to have fire. I mean, hail in itself is pretty scary, isn't it? We've all been exposed to hailstones. Here we're going to see fire. We're also going to see blood, the blood of people who are dying, being hit and struck by the hail and the fire. And a third of the trees are burned up, and all green grass is burned up. So you can just imagine the devastation there. When you see the grass burned up, what are the cattle going to eat? And the trees for the shelter and the shade and the fruit and all of that, we're beginning to see the devastation on man as far as food and other areas too. Without grass, you're going to have erosion. You're going to have mudslides. You're going to have uh, all sorts of things that we see today in California when they have mudslides, houses sliding down. It's going to go on and on and on. The second devastation here on earth is going to be with the second trumpet. The seas are struck. Then the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. When you see language uh, such as something like and you'll see it several times, more than several times in Revelation. That's an indication that it's not literal, but it's figurative. I say that because when you don't see the word something or like or as, take it literally. Otherwise, Revelation will mean nothing to you at all. So this one tells us clearly that it wasn't literally a mountain, but it was something that came down probably from heaven that was like a great mountain, and it was burning with fire, and it was thrown into the sea. What sea? all seas. And a third of the sea became blood. Not just the Mediterranean, which John could see as he was writing this, this epistle or this letter, but uh, all seas. Arctica, Antarctica, Antarctica, all of it. And the third of the living creatures are going to die. It's going to turn to blood. And of course, it's also going to be a loss of more food, isn't it? And a third of the ships are destroyed. So people are dying and they can't get... Uh, Supplies uh, today, ships still carry many, many supplies and resources and equipment for people. So now we've seen the vegetation struck, we've seen the sea struck, and these are going to come in rapid succession. And we're not even at the midpoint of the tribulation yet. This is not even where it gets rough. Can you imagine that? Third trumpet. This time the waters, everything but the sea, the lakes, the rivers, the ponds, then the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. The Israelites had a taste of this when they were going through the wilderness. And they came to a place they called Mara, where the water was bitter. And they couldn't drink the water. And so Moses had a solution for that from God. And what was that solution? Hmm? Took a tree and put it in the water, right? And it cured the waters. That tree, incidentally, is a picture of the cross of the Lord Jesus. And when his tree is placed in the waters of your life, there is healing. Amen? And so here we find in verse 10, this great star, that's a literal star, is falling. And it's not a literal torch, but it's like a torch. And it covers a third of the rivers, the springs of water. And that means that one third of all the fresh water supply is going to be destroyed. 
So we've seen food destroyed in verse 7. We've seen more food and people and equipment and everything destroyed in verse 8. Now verses 10 and 11, we find that the water supply is severely restricted. And the word wormwood, wormwood was a uh, plant in Israel and it's bitter. And that's why it's a picture of bitterness. So this is the third trumpet. Now the fourth trumpet. It moves into the heavens. And we're going to see here how the heavens are struck. Not the third heaven. And remember now the Jews saw three heavens. The first heaven would be the one with the birds around us. The second heaven would be the way out into the galaxy beyond the earth into the, uh, into the universe as we would call it. The third heaven of course is the throne of God. And nothing touches that. But this is going to cover the first heaven, the sky around us, the firmament, and the second heaven, the constellations, the stars. The fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened. A third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. And I looked and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. Here we find in verse 12 a reference to our solar system. That means the sun is not going to shine for one third of the day when it ordinarily would shine. Nor the moon. Nor the stars. It's going to be pure darkness. We talked about how we hardly ever experience silence anymore. We also hardly ever experience darkness anymore. Especially those who are in the city. If you live out in the country um, and there are no stars out at night... You might experience darkness, but for us, there's always some sense of light. This is going to cut down the light by one-third. That means that a third of the growing season is now cut off. Plants aren't going to be able to grow. Crops as grow as much as they would. And so that's going to be more starvation for people. What about the darkness itself? In my first assignment in the army, I was sent to Fairbanks, Alaska, and out of affection and out of a sense of relief, I daily checked the temperatures in Fairbanks, and right now we are averaging here in Albany probably in the 30s, and in Fairbanks, I like to, when I take a long walk at night with my dogs and it's cold, I get my little Siri iPhone out, and I ask her for our temperature, and then I start to ask for others in a certain order, Fairbanks, Alaska. So I'll get current temperature, and she'll say, this little voice there says, uh, Burr, it's cold, 27 degrees. Then I say, Fairbanks, Alaska. She says, it's cold in Fairbanks, Alaska, minus 42 degrees. Novosibirsk, Russia, that's the capital of Siberia. Brr, it's cold in Novosibirsk, Russia. It is minus 45 degrees. Then I want to feel a little relief. I go to Paris, France, and it's a little bit warmer there. But the point is, uh, it's cold in Fairbanks. I called the other day to get a coat sent to me. Didn't fit, but I just wanted to try one of those coats because when you get a coat from Fairbanks, it will handle anything. Well, when I got up there to Fairbanks, it was in March, and it was already 20 below zero in uh, March during the daytime. I left in November. And there was one good thing about going to Vietnam as I got out of the pure winter in Fairbanks. I left in November. It was already minus 20 at night. The day I took off for Vietnam, I looked at the paper, and Fairbanks had a raw temperature of minus 70 degrees. Hard to imagine. It's a dry cold, but it's cold. The more important thing for this message here is, even though I wasn't there, they say on the shortest day of the year, which is December 21, coming up this week, right? In Fairbanks, Alaska, the sun just peeps up over the horizon at quarter to 12, just before noon, and it drops right back 30 minutes later. It's virtual darkness all the time. I was there in the summer when it was sunshine all day and all night. 
and we would put aluminum foil on our windows to try to get some sleep. The tomatoes over there were huge. They were like pumpkins, and everything that was growing because the sun was out all the time was just huge, including the mosquitoes, whom we called affectionately moose-skeetoes. They were so big. But in the wintertime, when there is no light, the psychiatrist's couches are filled, and the line is around the corner with uh, army personnel and their spouses who are going crazy. Because when you get that much darkness, you lose a sense of light. Now, we all know what the sun does for us. I don't care how cold it is. If you can get outside and get some sunshine on your face, not only is it healthy for you physically with the vitamin D and all that, it's tremendously healthy for you psychologically. That So to cut out a third of it is going to have a deep impact on their lives. So this is uh, of devastation, absolute devastation. Well, as if that weren't bad enough, Verse 13, I looked and there was an angel flying through the midst of heaven. He said with a loud voice, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. So, so far there have been no woes. <laughs> I think there's been a lot of woe here, but they're saying, oh no, it's going to get much much worse. And so we have three more remaining ones, and we are now into the fifth trumpet in chapter 9. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth and to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have a power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads, and they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. The shape of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months and they had as their king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon. One woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these. So you can see why, in spite of all of the destruction of vegetation, seas, waters, and heavens, and that's terrible, that doesn't count compared to what's going to happen now, because we're moving into a much more serious situation, deep, strong, demonic activity. So chapter 9 and verse 1, let's go back and look at this angel. The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him, it's an individual, was given the key to the bottomless pit. Abusos in the Greek. It is the shaft of the abyss. There are many references in the Bible to it. It is a place in the inner earth where the demon spirits are stored. You remember when Jesus was ministering and he cast out the demon spirits and they said, don't send us to the abyss. They were talking about not wanting to go into this place that's a prison. It's locked. We all have demonic activity, don't we? Somebody once said one of the great uh, counseling fellows uh, had, uh, in fact, this is a rather common belief, 
among others too, especially in the Reformed tradition. We love them and appreciate them, but many believe that we are in the millennium right now. And to quote my old teacher, Chuck Smith, if we're in the millennium and Satan is in the bottomless pit in the millennium, I think his chain is a bit too long to suit me. And this is not the millennium because there will not be that demonic activity that we have right now. We all have demonic activity. We all have uh, attacks from the enemy to be sure. But there are some angels who are so fallen and so bad, these demon spirits, that God will not allow them to operate in our lives unless and until such time as he does it under a restricted purpose. They're that bad. So here we find the star, and the star is clearly Satan. We see him fallen. Jesus saw this prophetically when he was on earth, and he said to his disciples, uh, I saw Satan falling. And he looked into the future and saw this time. And the uh, reference is going to be a little bit later on in Scripture in the middle point. That's why we're just about at the midpoint now. We're going to see Satan falls or is cast out of heaven at the middle of the tribulation. Until now, we know from the book of Job and other references that he has access to the throne. And he's there, according to Hebrews, accusing the brethren day and night. But when he is cast out at that midpoint of the tribulation, we see reference to it here. That's when he really turns ugly, really gets a hold of the Antichrist and amps up his program of destruction. And that starts the last three and a half years of utter desolation and chaos. And that time is going to be so bad as the devil is angry and Jesus is angry and there's going to be no hope except to cry out to God and hope that he will spare those who will come to him. And he'll certainly save them, but many will not be able to be spared with their lives. So Satan is the star who's fallen from heaven to earth and he is given the key to release his own demon spirits. That shows you the power of Jesus Christ, that he is the one who tells Satan how far you can go and no further. Let's not focus in on the great power of Satan. We're going to see that it's really Jesus all along. He's the one who gives him the key and he allows him to release his demon spirits. Satan, verse 2, opens the bottomless pit. Smoke arises out of that pit like the smoke of a great furnace. The sun and the air are darkened because of the smoke of the pit. And then out of the smoke, locusts come upon the earth. Now, these are not literal locusts. These are demon spirits. In the fo They come together. They look like men, but they have that quality of banding together and moving together as locusts do with the devastating power of locusts. And to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. So again, let's focus not on Satan, but on Jesus. Jesus is the one who gives Satan the key. Jesus is the one who gives these demon spirits the power to exercise on man. So nothing is done by Satan, but what he gets permission, as he does in Job chapter 1, can I have an attack on Job? And God restricts him and says, yes, but don't kill him. Don't touch his body. Everything else is fair game. So you think the devil's pushing you too hard? Talk to God about it and tell him, Lord, I think we're getting a little bit of trouble here. Show me how to resist him. And God's going to say, according to James, first step in resisting the devil is what? Draw near to me. Come to me. And then I'll give you the strength to resist him. Verse 4, they were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth. That wasn't Satan commanding it. If Satan had his way, they'd kill everything. Jesus is there to determine how far they can go. Do not harm the grass or any green thing or any tree. That's not part of this program. But only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. In that day, it's going to be important to have a seal. In this day, it's important to have a seal. And Ephesians tells us that the born-again believer has the seal of God upon him or her, and that is the power of the Holy Spirit. In this day, they're going to have the seal of God. If they belong to Jesus, they're going to have a seal on their forehead. We're going to see shortly when the Antichrist amps his program up, he'll make his followers have a seal 
the number 666. So everybody's going to have to have a seal, either of the father or of the devil. In any event, uh, do not only harm those who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads, which will be most of the people in the world. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Now, up until now, the punishments have been quick, probably over within a day or two or three, much like the miracles and devastation done by Moses in Egypt with Pharaoh. Those were all quick solutions, 24 hours, 48 hours. Up until now, it's been quick. Now it's going to be five months of torment. And again, God is restricting what they can do. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. Not to be funny about this, it's going to be horrible. But imagine going to one of the highest buildings like the Empire State Building and jumping off that building and picking yourself up at the bottom of the building and saying, darn it, it didn't work, you know? And uh, just, uh, they're going to have to say, this, get out of here, we've got more guys coming down here. Now, people are going to do all sorts of weird things to kill themselves, but it's not going to work. They're not getting off that easily. Now, these demon spirits are ugly critters. The devil is ugly. I've talked to a few people who have seen demon spirits, and they have drawn pictures for me. I've never seen one. But they are very ugly creatures. They're very small. They look somewhat different. They can be uh, in the shape of a man and very ugly, or they can be in some kind of an animal lo look here. Here is an insect look. The shape of the locust was like horses. And if you look at a locust, Google it, and look at a, ho a locust, and you'll see it looks something like a horse. So the shape of the, lor the horses, uh, they, were they were like the shape of the horses, prepared for battle. They had crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men, with long hair like women, and they had teeth like lion's teeth, and breastplates like breastplates of iron. That means that so long as they're accomplishing their mission, they're strong. And the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running in battle. And this is very much like a real locust attack in the Holy Land. They move together quickly, and they look like horses, and they, their wings begin to make the sound like chariot wheels, and it's an awesome, awesome sound, they say. They had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. So they have their assignment. They're going to be powerful, but they are restricted by the Lord because he knows what he wants to accomplish, and what he is trying to accomplish here, as in any chastisement or punishment, is to try to bring forth righteousness from those who will repent and to bring forth punishment for those who will not. And again, referring to Satan, they had a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, which means destroyer or Apollyon in the Greek, the same thing. Jesus said about Satan that he has come to steal and kill and destroy. When you look at the work that he does in people's lives, it is nothing but destruction. And then verse 12, one woe is past. Behold, still two more woe, woes are coming after these things. So these are the worst of this phase of punishments. Now we get to the sixth trumpet, the angels from the Euphrates River. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them, and thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed. 
by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents having heads, and with them they do harm. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. The sixth trumpet has been misunderstood and it's been um, misunderstood more recently. Uh, if you read some of the older commentaries, they get it right. But one modern popular uh, author got it wrong. And he took this army of 200 million and he linked it with a reference coming later on when a literal army of the kings of the east are going to be coming across the Euphrates. And he linked the two together and said, this is an army of human beings. And he got people referring to an article in Red China, appearing in Time magazine in 1965, where the Chinese government said, we now have an army uh, of 200 million. And so they thought maybe this is going to be China and a few other nations. And so now the commentators are pulling back and thinking, well, it could be human beings. Nonsense. You look at what's just happened in the fifth trumpet. Look at the sixth trumpet. This is nothing but more demons. And it's going to be unbelievably bad. Look at verse 13. The sixth angel sounded. I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. The horns on the altar of incense, the horns on the altar of burnt offering represent strength. Horn is the strength of the animal. And this is the strength of God coming forth. He says to the sixth angel, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. First of all, why the Euphrates? I live in Albany. Why not the Hudson River? Why not uh, uh, the Nile? Why not one of the great rivers of the world? Euphrates is where it all began. The Euphrates River came out of the Garden of Eden. Euphrates River is where Babylon was, where all of the false worship and the satanic uh, uh, dogma and antichrist worship came from. And uh, Euphrates River is where it's going to all pretty much end as well as sin is taken back to that area. And uh, that's where four angels are being bound. Now we've got angels moving, or got demon spirits moving among us bothering us. We've got some demon spirits that are so bad, God is going to put them in the abyss. He does not want them hassling mankind. And then there are these four who are probably even worse. So much so that they are bound for a particular time and a particular purpose. And this is the time and the purpose. It is just ending the first half of the tribulation time and the number of the army of the horsemen, or the first or verse 15, they're going to release them to kill a third of mankind. Now, it can't be human beings because four angels aren't going to have, or four demons don't have control over armies. They can influence them somewhat. But this is a direct control from these four angels over these other demon spirits. And they'll be released to kill a third of mankind. We already saw widespread death in chapter 6. And there we saw the uh, devastation. The, a fourth of the earth was killed. That left three-fourths left. Now we take one-third of that three-fourths. And for all of you who did your fractions, you know that you have uh, a fourth, and now you have three-fourths, and you take a third of the three-fourths, you have how much left? <laughs> one half. One half of the world's population is now left. That means we just went over 7 billion in the population today. Who knows what it's going to be in that day, but in this day it would be well over 2.5 billion people are killed by this attack from these spirits. And thus I saw horses in the vision. This is how they look. We saw them look like locusts. 
in the earlier part of the chapter. Here they look like horses with riders and uh, breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, sulfur yellow, heads like horses were like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. Those who hold this as a literal uh, army, aside from the problems of the logistics, how many were in the military here? Anybody in the military? Uh, the logistics, I was a company commander in Alaska, and I'll tell you, just for 150 fellows, to try to get the logistics, the food, the supplies, the uh, sanitation, all of that. That was a huge undertaking. Uh, can you imagine at the two, uh, 200 million? It would, would not be possible. Uh, but uh, 200 million demon spirits, no logistics problems. These guys don't need to eat. They don't have to clean up after themselves. They just go in and do their damage. And... Um, some have said, well, if it's men, this is a picture of warfare, and it could be atomic bombs, and whatever. Yeah, it could be, could be a number of things. But it could also just be purely out of the pit of hell as well. So uh, whatever method is going to be, it's going to kill a third of mankind that's remaining. Uh, and the fire and the smoke and the brimstone coming out of their mouths. What does fire and smoke and brimstone conjure up in our minds? Hell. Lake of fire, doesn't it? Finally, the final place of man. Fire and hell. And think about all of this. We're not going to be, if you're in Christ, you're not going to go through this. But if the Lord were to come today and take you out of the way, would someone in your family or your circle of friends be left behind? And if so, they would have to go through this. What happened if you came to the Lord that you gave your heart to Christ? What did someone do to you to bring you to Christ? Someone shared the good news with you. What's our obligation? Say, first of all, whew, thank God I won't be here to see it. Yeah. But then I've got family and friends who will if the Lord comes now. I need to get the good news out. Amen? We'll talk more about that shortly. All right, this is going to be a horrible situation. Verse 19, their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents having heads, and with them they do harm. So this is a picture of demonic activity as John sees it. The amazing thing, and really not so amazing, verse 20, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. You would think conceptually that with all of this going on, they'd wake up and say, uh, I don't want any more of this. Lord, help me. Is anybody witnessing at that time? The 144,000, presumably. We'll see in Revelation there is an angel going around. And like a satellite almost, and uh, proclaiming the gospel. We're going to see shortly in Jerusalem, two witnesses will be standing up, and perhaps they're already at work now. Some think it'll be Moses brought back, and also Elijah. Moses representing the law, and Elijah, the prophets. We don't know for sure. But there'll be witnessing going on. There'll no doubt be some kind of television programs about Christ, and radio, and literature. Um, They'll be watching Reach Out at that time. We'll be keeping those uh, CDs around, right? We're going to be saving those. And uh, they'll have a chance to hear the gospel. But they're not going to want to do that. They're not going to want to repent. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons, idols of gold, silver, brass, stone. They're going to still be involved in their murders, their sorceries. That's an interesting word. What's the Greek word for sorceries? It's... Uh, you know it, pharmakia. And from that we get the word pharmacy, drugs. And uh, the drugs were no doubt involved with their worship of, their, of the different gods. And today as well. Um, we talk about drugs and uh, we talk about uh, the street drugs and we're all against that. And I think for the most part we're all on the same page about the, pharma, the uh, medical side of things. Uh, necessary, uh, unfortunately in so many cases, but... No doctor that I ever know said, hey, just, just start taking medications. They're just good for you. No, no, no. They have all sorts of restrictions. Go to your pharmacy. Hey, just give me all the meds you can find on shelf number one. Sure, we're having a bargain basement sale day. Take all you want. No, they are very strict about that. 
Very strict, because everybody realizes the dangers of it. Uh, one thing I learned early on in hospital ministry, as I would go to see people who had some serious situations, and I'd say, how are you doing? Well, I had this dream, and I felt that I was so-and-so. And you get these bizarre stories. And your first reaction is, they're nuts. <laughs> they're here because they're having their foot worked on. They ought to get their head worked on. But they're not nuts. You trace it back to medications. Again, I'm not saying don't take medications, but I'm saying what the doctors say, they're going to be side effects. Uh, these poor advertisements, they try to advertise something. It was like in the old days when they'd advertise cigarettes and they'd have to say, it's going to kill, etc. Medication, and you're, you're floating like a butterfly and you want to have a euphoria because of antidepression and you see a nice sky and the butterfly. And uh, why don't you try, was it Levitra or something else here? Be warned that, and then da 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 all the things that can happen if you take it, you know, whoa, <laughs> including depression, including murder, uh, or suicide. Um, so we need to watch out for the medications. I'm talking medically now. Don't get dependent. I know folks who consciously try to take as little as they can, get off it as soon as they can. Uh, unfortunately, many folks have gotten hooked on it. But... Um, That'll be a major part of it, a major part of that demonic worship. And so they're not going to repent because of all these problems. Why? Well, I've made a little note here in the lesson on the ninth chapter. Awareness of sin and grace, not suffering, brings repentance. Awareness of one's sins and of the grace of God, that's what is going to bring Repentance, And think about this for your family and friends. You've got people you're witnessing to, a spouse, a relative, a dear friend. And you keep witnessing and witnessing and you show them tracks and you give them CDs and have them watch television programs and they just don't get it. And you're thinking, what's wrong? What's wrong? You pray for a miracle in their lives. My former partner in law had a baby who was born at six months. Do the math. Six months the baby came out. She'd been on oxygen. They were concerned about the eyes. I was going to a church in Schenectady with Angie at an old church in Glenmont that we were praying. We prayed and prayed. That child came out. She came out well. She came out normal, seeing a little smaller than the average kid, but still perfectly well. I haven't seen her in many, many years. Surely my partner is going to realize that is the hand of God and give his heart to Christ. Well, he said, thank God for doctors. Thank God for the miracle of medicine. And that's what he ascribed it to. And that's not unusual because suffering, miracles, even your own testimonies alone and I use the word alone, are not going to bring people to Christ. Now, miracles are important. Your testimonies are important. Suffering can be a catalyst. I came to Christ through financial suffering. You came to Christ maybe through suffering as well, but it has to have the awareness of sin and of the grace of God. So if you're wondering why somebody's not moving to come to Christ and you've seen things happen, you've seen their world fall apart and you've tried to share Christ and they're still not coming, don't give up, keep praying, but you'll understand why maybe the missing link or links is not there. Lord, make them aware of their sins and of the grace of God and use me as an instrument to reach them. That, I think, is a real key thing here because suffering alone isn't going to do it. We see suffering through earthquakes, typhoons, all of these things happening, and they will happen more and more uh, as we get closer to this time. We pray for people's salvation. We pray they're going to come to Christ. But that event alone may be a factor, but it alone is not going to bring them to Christ. That event can cause them to become aware of their sins and of the grace of God. Well, how do they become aware of their sins and of the grace of God? That comes through the word of God, doesn't it? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Paul says in Romans 10, and the feet of those who bring the good news are beautiful. Are you praying for the saints and the unsaved? 
Are you bringing your tithes and the offerings into the storehouse? Are you giving to the work of God? If so, look down at your feet right now and say, I have beautiful feet. You didn't think you did. I'm working on a corn right now, but it doesn't make any difference. I've got beautiful feet. Amen? All right. So that's bringing now to the midpoint of the tribulation. And uh, we can go on and finish this up. Probably I can get the whole book done about uh, midnight tonight if you want to hang with me. Or we could maybe just uh, put this off until not next week, which is Christmas special program. Please, please come. But the week after, we're going to get to the midpoint of the tribulation, chapters 10, 11, and 12. That's where it all begins to really ramp up. We see the mighty angel with a little book in chapter 10. Uh, and the two witnesses in chapter 11 we already talked about, they're going to be killed and then resurrected. Talk about news on CNN or whoever is covering it then. And then in chapter 11, the seventh trumpet is going to be blown as the kingdom is proclaimed. We're going to then see in chapter 12, the woman, the child, and the dragon. We're going to see in chapter 13, the Antichrist rising up. He's going to be the beast from the sea with his sidekick, the false prophet. Chapter 14, we see our 144,000 Jews along with Jesus. And then we're going to begin to see more of the devastation coming about. The bowls of judgment in chapter 15 begin to open up. It gets worse than we've seen before. Chapter 16 talks about the bowls. Chapter 17 deals with the church. At that time, the false church based in Rome, Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots, as God destroys the church. Chapter 18, we're going to see commercial Babylon fall as God destroys all of mammon, the godly, the godless system of the world. Chapter 19, I love to see myself in a photograph. How about you? I'm here, and uh, I'm in this book, in this page uh, with Jesus as I'm coming back. Chapter 19, he's coming back with his saints on a white horse, and uh, you and I will be with him if we're in Christ. He's king of kings and lord of lords. Chapter 20, he takes Satan, and I can't wait for that, and he binds him in that abuso for a thousand years. Uh, and then he allows a rebellion at the end of the millennium, and so many people want to be with Christ. He destroys them. Then the white throne judgment at the end of the millennium where we judge the unrighteous of all ages, Jesus with us with him there. Chapter 21 and 22, eternity. New heaven, new earth, the eternal state. Fabulous book. Take it chronologically and take it literally unless it says to do otherwise. Okay? Let's bow our hearts before the Lord. Father, we thank you for your word, the power of your word, and the specificity of your word. Help us, Lord, to examine our own hearts to see if we are in the faith. And if we are not, Lord, forgive us for our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Help us to realize we are sinners, but the grace of God is more than sufficient to forgive us and to save us. Save us, Lord, and send us out into our corner of the world to share the good news with others. We don't want anybody going through this. In Jesus' name, amen.